Good morning and welcome to QTX Real World Futures. I'm Professor Melinda Edwards and it is my pleasure to be your tour guide this morning. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Turbul and Yagara as the nation's first owners of the lands from which we broadcast this morning. We recognise that this has always been a place of teaching, learning and research and we acknowledge the very important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play in our university community. Now this morning we are very excited to be joining with the Proteo Institute and to welcome a panel of experts to contribute further insights into our discussion. We have around 550 people registered to attend this event online this morning. So for those of you who haven't joined us before, we are QTX. Physically, we are situated in the Graduate School of Business at QUT's beautiful Gardens Point campus in Brisbane, Australia. Our business is executive education, and we bring together discipline experts from across our faculties and the broader community to create real world education solutions for government and corporate clients. In this series, we go even further into the future, in fact, sharing our discipline experts insights into the future of working, living and thinking with you, our community, enabling us to contribute as a truly civic university and at the same time learn from you through your questions and perspectives to ensure that our teaching and research remain relevant to your needs. Now, how will this morning work? We'll be doing things a little differently and the session will be slightly longer today to enable us to include insights from our additional guest experts. To set the scene, we'll be hearing from Jay Wetherill AO, the CEO of Mindaroo Foundation. I'll then introduce our feature speaker, Dr. Harris Eyre, for his presentation. And following that, a few luminaries will join Harris and maybe Jay for our Q&A session. As always, throughout our program, we encourage you to post your questions and comments using the chat function, which my excellent colleague, Adam Lenahan, will monitor so that he can theme and present a representative cross-section of those on your behalf during our Q&A session. So, to get things started, it is my pleasure to introduce Jay Wetherill AO, former Premier of South Australia and current CEO of Mindaroo Foundation. Mindaroo's Thrive by Five initiative advocates for positive community-level change based on evidence, prevention and collaboration. They are big believers in enabling the translation of research into effective policy, practice and service delivery. With a vision of enabling Australian children to develop, learn and thrive so they can build a better future for themselves and their communities. Jay is going to set the scene for our feature presentation today, explaining why this is such a critical topic for our future. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Wetherill. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Edwards, and uh, I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Wadjuk people here as part of the Noongar Nation in uh, Perth, in fact, Fremantle here in uh, Western Australia. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be amongst uh, such a stellar array of speakers, uh, Professor Harris Eyre um, and also adjunct Professor Michael Hogan, as well as uh, Laurie Rubenstein and Matthew Wright. Um, all of this uh, that you're about to hear in a moment is about exploring the way in which uh, our brains develop from the, the early years in life and how profound that is for the life trajectory, skills, learning, behaviour, relationships, really the whole of um, capability is established uh, in those early years. But as important as that science is, to translate that into action, we have to find a means of communicating about it, which is powerful for opinion leaders, but also is motivating for the broader community. And so I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking today about the concept of strategic communications, but much of what we're going to be discussing today is going to fit within that concept. Uh, Harris has come up with um, a fantastic new frame for considering this whole concept the notion of brain capital, and in particular, brain health and, and brain skills. And this provides us with uh, a new framework for considering the way in which all of human capability really springs from those early years. Um, so that to, to, to actually gain traction on the, uh, the systems which are necessary to allow us to 
fully realise this opportunity for the whole of humanity, really, that is to unlock the, the importance of brain health and brain skills, we have to, as a society, create a movement for change which uh, creates the political circumstances for our leaders to act. Uh, and that involves communicating about this topic in a way which is which leaps beyond the you know the lecture room and the and the and the laboratory into the lives of ordinary uh, people around the world, and and hence the need for uh, communicating in a way which is able to build coalitions. Um, for my part, uh, opinion leaders are going to be looking over the horizon at those things which are challenging for them and their communities. And this notion of brain capital provides, I think, a very powerful frame for doing that. One thing which is troubling uh, opinion leaders around the world is this growing phenomena of inequality, the way in which, as our society is becoming more prosperous, they're also becoming less equal. This notion of inequality is a very powerful driver and, in fact, drives further uh, deteriorations in the, the sorts of brain skills and the brain development which are necessary for participating in the modern economy. So we have this paradox, as we continue to grow and as equality, inequality continues to, to grow, we find more and more people are swept to the margins of society and that therefore uh, creates growing inequality. And the skills and capabilities which are necessary to participate in the economy of the future are the very skills and capabilities which are grown in those early years. But they're also the same skills and capabilities that can be uh, adversely affected by growing inequality. So we have this feedback mechanism, which is creating growing inequality, which is causing greater impairment of the way in which our children develop, which of course feeds back into the inequality loop. So this is a, a major concern for policymakers and is a very powerful frame. The second frame, which I think is, um, is highly motivating, is the notion of female economic empowerment. Uh, the, the truth is that much of the burden of care, uh, which uh, involves the caring for children in the, the early years, falls on women. And the, the unfair distrib distribution of unpaid work in societies, not just in this country, but around the world, means that many women are locked out of the opportunities to participate in work and family life. And this can represent a very powerful mechanism for mobilising a large movement for change. The notion of actually creating our systems of support for the early years, which are not only critically important for children, but also critically important to provide the, the scope and the opportunity for women to participate more broadly in the life of our community and work life through the proper sharing of those responsibilities in the early years represents, I think, a massive opportunity for us to advance this agenda. Uh, it speaks to men, it speaks to women, um, and it addresses one of the great unresolved questions uh, in societies, not, in, not just in this country, but around the world, which is the inequality that experienced by women. So, um, much of what you're going to hear today is going to be about communication and about the way in which we frame this important science. Many people on the call will be very familiar with the science, but today is really about talking about it in a way which is cogent and takes that science out of the laboratory and takes it into the real world and is actionable for uh, communities to demand more of their politicians and for politicians to create the sort of systems that are necessary to advance our brain health and build our brain skills. So I hope you have a wonderful session today. It's, um, it's an exciting group of speakers and there could not be a more important public policy agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay. Wow, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and a great setting of the stage for our presentation. So now to why we are all here, to hear from Dr. Harris Eyre will be sharing his insights on the implications of the emerging brain capital paradigm. Dr. Eyre's formal, formal bio, which you will have read, reveals that after growing up in tropical Australia, 
Harris Air MD PhD, originally trained in clinical medicine and neuroscience. He's now a global executive pursuing technological and systemic breakthroughs to advance brain capital. He's an alumnus of Forbes 30 Under 30 and the Fulbright Scholar Program. And in 2021, he was awarded an EB1A green card and honor typically reserved for Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winners. But who is the man behind all of those achievements? He tells me that he is still recovering from the culture shock of moving from working as a doctor in mental health psychiatry clinics on Palm Island to Fulbright Scholarship Neuroscience Study at UCLA, UCLA in Beverly Hills. Also saying that Palm Island and Beverly Hills are equally unique environments. He is homesick for Australia at the moment and really looking forward to coming back ASAP for good coffee and smashed avo, which apparently <laughs> we do the best. Uh, to treat his homesickness, he enjoys listening to ABC Radio National podcasts, something he has done since he was a teenager. And he is absolutely delighted to be speaking at QT Brisbane today in his home state, which he used to think of as the big smoke when he was growing up in Mackay. And he tells me that he is doing his best not to be intimidated by all you city slickers in the crowd. Now today, Dr. Ayer's presentation is titled, Building Brains Better, Science-Inspired Investing for Brain Health and Skills for the Future. So ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seatbelts for another wild ride with Real World Futures. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Harris Ayer to the microphone. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Melinda, for that, that terrific introduction. Uh, thank you to the QUT team, Adam, uh, Allison, and everyone. Uh, it's delightful to be here uh, to be able to speak with you. I've been looking forward to getting back to Australia, but of course, uh, that hasn't been very easy uh, during COVID. So I'm, I'm speaking to you today from the US, where I live now full time. Um, to say that I'm uh, very grateful to Jay as well for the introductory comments. Uh, you can imagine. Uh, you know, we are so grateful to have Jay in the early childhood brain development field and also uh, working on brain capital issues. Uh, Jay obviously has a very, very impressive background uh, being the Premier of South Australia and strategic communications. Every time I speak to Jay, I just get a masterclass in that area. So for me, who was a, a PhD student at University of Adelaide, uh, only, if, you know, maybe uh, five years ago uh, when Jay was Premier, it's a big deal to be able to work with him now. And so, so thank you again, Jay. Um, and, and thank you, of course, to Michael Hogan, who has uh, really orchestrated all of this. Uh, a couple of quick comments before I get started. Uh, hello to, uh, to some special people. I think Michael Burke, uh, Professor Michael Burke in Geelong. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, Mark Heinemeyer, who's in Dana Point, Southern California, as a colleague, uh, co-founder of the Proteo Institute. And then also to, uh, to mom, dad, and Nan and Mackay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be proposing today why Australia should be leading uh, the, this, this brain building uh, revolution, if we can call it that, or at least a new platform for progress, as Jay called it, a framework. I'm going to offer ways that I think Australia can become a leader. Uh, we have some competition globally, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's keep up Australia and let's even take over. I'm going to start by suggesting that uh, there are a lot of brain challenges in the world. The world is really fast moving and hard to keep up with, right? I, I don't know if I'm the only one that feels that, like day to day, look at the news, what is going on in the world? And, and even, you know, when you're just going to the supermarket, speaking to someone like, what is going on? Well, we contend, uh, colleagues and I at the OECD contend that, that there are a bunch of brain challenges, whether it's things we know about like depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's disease, things like this, stress, but other things that are also brain related. Um, you ever think like that, that uh, science denialism, anti-vaccine sentiments, anti-vax, that, that is in some ways neurologically rooted. And there are a number of colleagues at UCSF in San Francisco working on that. Uh, even political tribalism uh, has, uh, has a neurological roots in the brain. So uh, these are all brain-based. So how long can we sustain this for, really? Like, how, how long can we really sustain these, these, this barrage of, of brain-based issues is my contention. And of course, all roads lead to the brain. Um, 
It's so, so, so to really understand the world, we do need to understand the brain. And then perhaps to sort of optimize our approaches to the world, we need to you know, look after our brains and we need to really uh, develop policies and environmental uh, opportunities for our brains to, to really flourish and function optimally. So one of the amazing things about working with the OECD is to really, really think hard about economics. So the OECD is the sister organization to the United Nations. I can put it simply like that. It's got 38 member countries, Australia and, and, and the US are member countries. And it's really the world's think tank for economics. So when we look at uh, the modern economy, these three things on the left here, climate, viruses and brains, these are all considered as externalities. They're not really taken very seriously or historically haven't been taken very seriously in economics. Uh, of course, COP26 is uh, just finishing up now. So we are starting to take climate more seriously. Uh, we know that a little virus from Wuhan can crash the global economy. Uh, so we, we, we suggest that a collection of brain-based issues could also actually be dragging the economy uh, nationally, uh, state and Queensland could be dragging the economy, lost productivity, uh, all sorts of uh, social discord from these brain issues. Uh, and, and this can't go on, right? This just can't go on. Uh, we're, we're losing trillions of dollars of productivity from these brain issues, maybe even more. So we need to fix it. Uh, it's not good enough anymore to have this kind of disarticulated model with all these externalities here on the left. Of course, uh, Bobby Kennedy said very famously that uh, GDP measures everything except that which is worthwhile. And I would agree with that. And from that previous slide, you can tell that my colleagues uh, at the OECD uh, agree with this as well. So uh, this is a problem. If we, cut, if we keep GDP as the sort of lone star out there uh, or, or the tower on the hill, then that's not good. It's just going to keep perpetuating where we are right now. So we need another way. Um, in summary, of course, brain issues are left behind in economics policy and investing that we have to fix it. Because if we can't, I really don't think that uh, the future is very bright. Uh, so let's get busy. Let's put the brain at the center of the economy. Uh, let, us, let us really think about how do we gross up these brain-based challenges that I mentioned and put them right at the heart of the global economy and think about what does that mean for policy? How do we tune policies to, to, to help our brains? How do we invest to help our brains? And how do we track brain issues at a regional, state, national, global level as well? That's part of this. So enter brain capital. Uh, brain capital is a conceptual asset that we've developed and we will continue to develop to make it much more real, uh, tangible, definable, uh, quantifiable and trackable. Brain capital is the way that we sort of gross up these issues. Brain capital is brain health and brain skills in the current economy, in the brain economy. So sim simple algorithm with three bits, brain health and brain skills in the brain economy. That's brain capital. So what is the brain economy? It's really a sort of neuroscience inspired knowledge economy. We know that uh, the, the, the economy is getting more and more knowledge intense, right? As uh, the more uh, lower skilled jobs are being automated away or lower skilled jobs are being offshored. So we have really knowledge intense uh, economies now and jobs. Innovation is a, is a really key uh, outcome of, uh, of our productivity. We also know in the brain economy that stigma rates in many, in many areas for sort of depression, Alzheimer's disease, that's falling. So that means that people are talking more about brain issues, particularly during COVID, right? Uh, we're talking more about these, type, these types of brain issues. So that's a good thing. Uh, the brain economy is also the economy is the confluence of uh, neuroscience discoveries are increasing. And Australia, of course, has wonderful neuroscience research and, and breakthroughs, whether it's QBI, uh, in Brisbane, or the Flory in, uh, in Melbourne, or the Brain and Mind uh, group out of Sydney. And the brain economy is also the one where, where COVID has harmed our brains profoundly, whether it's been just sort of a social isolation harm of the brain, or whether it's actually like the effect of the COVID virus on the brain. So all these things we really would consider as a, as a confluence are called the brain economy. Brain health is really talking about an absence of disease, an absence of autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, TBI, or, or at least better management of those sort of clinical grade disorders. And brain health also invokes strengths of the brain, you know, resilience, creativity, wisdom, these types of things. 
brain health is in, is in some ways a new way of thinking about mental health or mental ill health. We call it brain health. Brain skills are, are of course, just the skills that are uh, relevant to the modern economy. Uh, having emotional intelligence, social intelligence, uh, being able to be resilient, be gritty in the face of a very rapidly changing world, to be adaptable to a world where you wake up and you don't know what's going to happen from day to day. Uh, I know in Australia with, with these sort of rolling lockdowns, it was very hard to know exactly what was going to happen from week to week. Um, so so that, that, that's the conclusion of brain capital, just in summary, brain health and brain skills in the brain economy. And this is what Jay Wetherill was talking about. This is a, a pictorial version of this, one of Jay, a, a Jay Wetherillism, I would call it, which, of which there are a couple. And here we talk about, of course, on the y-axis brain capital and the x-axis is time. We have existing inequality here on the left. And, and for people of lower means, it's a downward spiral, downward spiral here to go down further and further. If you lose your job to your automation or offshoring, you know, you lose your job, you have financial pressure, you have less purpose in life, you can get depressed and anxious. And if you're depressed and anxious, it's harder for you, right? Muster the energy to go up and get reskilled and get back out there into the economy. So that's a, that's a vicious negative circle. And for people that are the haves, well, uh, they're just increasingly, you know, educated, better educated, their jobs are more and more cognitively intense. There's starting to be all these sort of impact jobs where you can not just sort of do well monetarily, but also like do, do well uh, for society. And so you just get, you know, kind of better and better. You get more mastery. Yes, you've got to work hard, but you get mastery and a sense of, of purpose. And so you get better. So, so this is something that we need to be aware of because this inequality is just going to get more and more in, in the brain economy. So uh, the contention that, that we have, this, this insight comes from colleague Andrew Nevin, who's a, a, a very prominent economist, Andrew S. Nevin, that if we sort out brain capital, everything else will take care of itself. Productivity will take care of itself because we won't have such a lag of sort of depressed workers and stressed workers. Innovation will take care of itself because uh, people in society will be much more creative. They'll have much more energy and, and chutzpah to go out and, and create things and invent things and start companies. They'll have that sort of determination and it will just be more well-being as well. So just, you know, let's just take care of brain capital and everything else flows from that. We've developed uh, and published earlier this year a brain capital grand strategy. Grand is because it's sort of multi-pronged. We want to make an index or a dashboard to be able to actually define and track brain capital. We have a working group, the OECD, working on that, of very smart economists working with neuroscientists and psychologists. We want to think about brain capital in all policies. What are policies doing to reduce brain capital and what are policies doing potentially to increase brain capital? And then how do we invest in brain capital? And not just government grants, but let's think more broad than that. Let's think about you know, taxation restructuring, uh, private sector, public-private approaches, social impact bonds, uh, other types of sovereign bonds, uh, venture capital, venture philanthropy, et cetera. Brain capital obviously needs to be thought about across the lifespan. Uh, we're going to talk today a lot about early childhood, which is great, uh, but we should also be thinking about across the lifespan. So uh, Alzheimer's disease, what are we doing to prevent Alzheimer's disease? Uh, which is, which is super critical to have people that, that are living into older age, but, but really cognitively as, as, as astute as they can be. Uh, and so th this is a nice graphic from 2008. Of course, we need to update it now because so much has changed in the world. But, but you can think, right, if you look at these, these red and blue uh, boxes across here, that there are things that increase our brain capital and things that decrease brain capital. Uh, one of the things I think we need to think about is what is social media doing to our brain capital? Nowadays, I would say that it's actually quite toxic for our brains, particularly for teenage girls, and also for people that are unfortunately susceptible to believing misinformation and believing disinformation, to believe information that's put on social media that is intentionally meant to mislead people or is sort of tribal or radical or is potentially put there by foreign power. Uh, so interesting framing here. So let, let's keep lifespan in mind as we go through the rest of this presentation. Uh, when we think about tackling these brain-based issues, right, uh, there's a lot of siloing. We've got, we've got neurologists doing their thing. We've got psychiatrists doing their thing. We've got teachers and educators doing their thing. We've got pediatricians and then investment experts. They, they tend to not really talk to each other a lot very seriously. Or if they talk to each other, it's just kind of like socially at the football on the weekend. They're not really working together. Uh, but brain capital cuts across all this, right? So how do we get these people to really 
dig in and buy into this stuff and then work together. Well, that's kind of part of what we're trying to do with the OECD initiative. Uh, this is a couple of screen grabs from the OECD initiative. You're welcome to look at the website in, in, in your spare time. You'll see the different papers that we've published and uh, different people involved. Uh, it's, there's, a, there's a lot there and it keeps growing. Uh, we were fortunate with our first seminar uh, to have it in, in January kicked off by the Secretary General of the OECD uh, and then also by Admiral Bill McRaven, who was the head of US uh, Special Operations for the entire US Department of Defense, former Navy SEAL, four-star Admiral. So uh, very interesting things that you'll find on the website uh, if it interests you. Our steering committee is also wonderful, very uh, intergenerational. Uh, and very interdisciplinary as well. We have different working groups with the OECD. Uh, please reach out to me if you're interested in engaging in this. Uh, you know, we have brain capital diplomacy type uh, working group, working with, with different people from the State Department, for, former State Department ambassadors, uh, the brain capital index that I mentioned, uh, which is working with economists, neuroscientists, and psychologists. We have a thematic working groups. We have one on women's issues, uh, female empowerment, as Jay talked about, which is so critical. And then brain capital investing as well. We have some former World Bank executives and people involved with the World Economic Forum. So we're really trying to bring all this stuff together. Uh, still early days, the OECD work started only in January. So we're still new in the, in the developmental phase. Uh, very grateful to the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute out of Dallas, Texas for giving us some seed funding. Thank you. Um, here are some uh, papers that were written on the productivity side. Uh, if, if, the, if the inequality concept didn't grab you, uh, maybe this will grab you to say that uh, lagging brain capital, people, people that are depressed or not doing so well psychologically, that's a big productivity issue. And so if you're a, a big corporate CEO or if you're a big investor, uh, you, you know, your, your entities that you're involved in are probably going to be less productive right now. So how do you boost the productivity of your investments or the companies you, that you're involved in? Uh, so if you're interested in this, look at uh, the Financial Times. Megan Green, who's the uh, chief economist at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, wrote, up, wrote this up uh, on our behalf and, and did a wonderful job. She's, it's wonderful to work with such astute journalists and, and, and scientists. Uh, and then another article here, which was very popular in Canada for financial posters like the Australian Financial Review in Australia, for, for, for the Canadian version, talking about the effect of uh, COVID-19 on people's brains and how that's sort of going to make the Canadian economy us, us sag a little bit. Um, so we, we contend, of course, again, if we're just nailing this capital concept that uh, there are no brains without capital. And there is no capital without brains. So no brains without capital and no capital without brains. This is a kind of simple way of distilling what we're talking about here. We're, we are saying this in economic terms because we're trying to, 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 to sort of speak to economic stakeholders, to senior bureaucrats, senior politicians, senior asset managers. Uh, so this is, this is not necessarily as, uh, as, uh, as, as warm and humane language. Uh, we, need to, we need to get there. We're sort of starting with speaking to the economics crowd. Um, so I offer this, uh, this quote to you to see what you make of it. Uh, this is a wonderful YouTube video. I'm told that it's the most popular YouTube video uh, and TED Talk, rather, TED Talk right now. So you can find it on the TED website or on YouTube. Uh, this is brilliant insights from the group that, that is led by Jay Wetherill. It's uh, Molly Wright, who's actually from Queensland, I believe. I think she's seven years old, and she does a great job of talking about the importance of early childhood brain development. And that's her brother there on stage. So if there's one single thing that you do at the end of this talk, please go home and watch this either on ted.com or on YouTube. Uh, please watch this. It's, it's well worth your time. Uh, people all around the world are watching it. And it's a, it's a soft power way of, of Australia, given Molly's from Queensland, of, of, of Aussies really kind of uh, endearing ourselves to, to people around the world, whether they're from Texas or from France, that everyone loves it. So please check it out. Uh, we do have a lot of really wonderful uh, expertise in Australia focused on early childhood brain development. Uh, Jay Wetherill is the CEO of Thrive by Five. Laurie Rubenstein is the lead of the Eracy Brain Builders Australia group. Uh, and Michael Hogan is leading the Thriving Queensland Kids Partnership. They will speak at the end of my talk. I'll let them talk about what they're doing because they'll do it much better justice. But to say that 
when I look around the world, we are the best in early childhood brain development, thinking, strategy, and innovation. Uh, also from Mindaroo uh, is looking at the effect of plastics on, uh, on human health. Uh, incredible to think that, you know, we, we kind of know that like air pollution is not good for our bodies or our brains. Air pollution is related to higher rates of heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. But, but I never thought until I met Sarah Dunlop, P Professor Sarah Dunlop, who leads this with the Mindaroo Foundation in Perth, that microplastics were an issue. But really when you stop to think about it, right, like, there are actually nanoplastic particles in most of the water that we drink uh, and also in most of the food that we eat. It's kind of everywhere now. It's really chilling to think about this. And the science is very poorly understood. So that's, it's possible that there's an epidemic of, of effects of microplastics uh, on our bodies, uh, particularly for the developing brain. And so uh, I, through the OECD, we're doing what we can to support uh, Sarah Dunlop's work and try to raise awareness for this because it, it is so profound uh, that we don't really know much about it. So we need to get very serious about, about dealing with this issue. Uh, female empowerment, as Jay said, is potentially the single greatest uh, brain capital building strategy that we have. Uh, this is a paper, this, this is an excerpt from a paper rather that we published uh, earlier this year. Uh, Co-authors include uh, Naoko Kawaguchi, who's the gender lead for the OECD, who's a wonderful uh, Japanese European uh, economist and, and expert. There are actually, when you look at it across from left to right, across the translational spectrum, there are inequities uh, in understanding uh, female brain issues, whether it's like simple things like in basic neuroscience in the lab with, with rats and mice and, and stuff. They, historically, we've mostly looked at, at male uh, brains and neurons and, and brain tissue. And that's a problem, right? Because the you know, male and female body is very different all the way through to uh, misunderstandings and lack of attention and funding being paid to clinical trials, not having enough uh, sex and gender mixture all the way through to public policy issues. And so on and on. So if you're interested in this, please uh, look at this paper and we will be publishing more and more on this topic in the future with our, with our colleagues. Uh, a shout out for Ilya Pinya. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Cheryl Batchelor, if you want to reach out to her, please do. Uh, she is running wonderful, I, I would say world leading uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander sort of focused uh, brain capital, brain health empowerment uh, workshops. How, how do you support people across uh, the, the uh, ATSI community to, to have better brain health? So, so Cheryl is really pioneering this field. And, and again, we're very proud to be able to uh, promote Cheryl's work within the OECD to people globally uh, for First Nations people, uh, because I think what Cheryl's doing could be could be um, localized to different First Nations people across the world in different continents. Uh, so please check out her website and, and here's her on LinkedIn. Um, to mention, it's interesting to think as we go through and, and talk about these different thematic policy issues that your brain could be a national security risk. Uh, at the Brookings Institution, we're involved in a task force that's looking at this. Uh, basically, if you, if you are in a state of economic despair, if you're in a state of, of lesser educational attainment, socioeconomic issues, like uh, which is common in the southeast of the United States, uh, in, in states such as Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, you, you are uh, statistically much more susceptible to being radicalized through the internet, through social media. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether it's Facebook, right, we all know about the, the Facebook expose that's going on at the moment with, with Francis Hogan, who's going around the world, the whistleblower with Facebook, uh, or the fact that Donald Trump has created Truth Social recently, and I think that's launched now. Um, so uh, we, we know that, 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 that foreign influence, you know, Russia, China, other countries have been, there is data out there from intelligence organizations to say that they are influencing these technology platforms. Uh, think of, think of the, uh, the Capitol riot, January 6th in the US and Washington DC. All of these things are related to sort of the way that we can be radicalized, uh, particularly certain groups. And so Carol Graham at Brookings, as a senior economist at Brookings, uh, wrote this report here on the left. Uh, she, she led the task force that I was uh, fortunate to be involved in uh, really exposing these issues. And so what do we do about this? And, and I would assume that this is also an issue in Australia that we need to take very seriously. So if you're interested, please check out Carol's report. Um, and uh, and we, we are continuing to, to follow this and think about what solutions could we offer 
to how do how do we fix uh, mis and disinformation and radicalization on the internet and on social media platforms? What do we do about that? Uh, to mention here, of course, that ESG, environment, social governance, which is on the top of our minds with COP26, uh, we really need to, um, to recognize that ESG is here. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's here. There are $40.5 trillion in assets managed around the world that, that are sort of uh, apportioned to ESG metrics. Uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, which is the biggest asset manager, is behind this. This is great. So it's very interesting. We propose that what about brain ESG? What about B ESG? Uh, because we know that brain issues cut across all E, S, and G. We normally think about brain issues in the health part of social, but what about in environment? What about the, the effect of uh, air pollution on the brain? Well, that's, that's negative, so that's part of E. Uh, science denialism is associated with climate denialism, and that is neurologically rooted. Bruce Miller at UCSF has written about this in Scientific American and, and JAMA. Uh, nanoplastics or harming our brains and bodies we've talked about relevant to water management, uh, short-termism and greed in capitalism, which, which leads to a, to a in, disinterest in engaging with new business models. Uh, that's neurologically rooted. There's, there's wonderful work from a French business school professor and psychologist on the, the neural, the brain circuitry of greed and short-termism. Uh, and then, of course, we know uh, with our work with, with Proteo that governance of, of brain technology companies is poor. You have very technical companies that are doing technical AI, technical genetics, things like this, that are being invested in by general investors. And so the governance is often not very good as, as, as sort of generalist investors can't really keep up with the intricacies of the technical fields of neurotechnology. Uh, and, and then, of course, we talked about how brain health issues uh, are key to corporate performance. So, so, so what if we had BESG and what if we could get some of that 40.5 trillion that I mentioned that is portioned to ESG metrics? What if we create BESG? Could we unlock potentially much more capital for neuroscience? Uh, this I think is very interesting and we're working on this. Uh, Jim Hackett in particular is, is very supportive. Uh, it's a colleague, he's a former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, uh, helping to think this through and, and what do we do with this? Where do we go with it? Uh, a book here that uh, that was commissioned by the Proteo Institute um, that I was a, a co-editor with Michael Burke as well from Deakin University, who's a, who's a wonderful long, long time colleague. This is all about how do we break silos down? Uh, we've got a lot of siloing going on when we think about optimizing brain issues. How do we smash those down? Transdisciplinary science is going beyond interdisciplinarity to actually force disciplines together. So to say, no longer can you just be interdisciplinary, you've got to fuse yourself and you've got to think like someone else from another discipline. Uh, so this, this book uh, came out in January of this year. We were, we were fortunate to have a couple of prominent Australians uh, uh, endorse it, which, which, for which I'm very grateful to Harold and, and Peter. So what this is all getting to, I think if we step back, let's step on the balcony about brain capital, have a breather and think about, what are we doing here? We're, we're, we're suggesting that society is at a crossroads with all these brain challenges, uh, that it's hard to keep up with what's going on in the world. So we really need a new human-centered narrative for progress that's based on what's good for us as citizens, and what's progressive for us. And we argue that we need to do that by merging brain science and society, merging brain science with economics and policy. I think that's the simple takeaway here is that we, we want this type of new approach. Uh, and this could become uh, a, some kind of policy platform or political platform in the future, it seems. I wanted to mention part of the group that we work with at the OECD is the NAEC group up the top there, New Approaches to Economic Challenges. It sits within the office of the Secretary General. And actually the Secretary General of the OECD now is Matthias Cormann, who's an Australian, a former uh, conservative politician from Western Australia. Uh, this government economist uh, for new economic systems is a new initiative of the NAEC, which is wonderful. So, so if anyone's interested in, in this group, bringing neuroscience to this group, or just bringing the Australian government economists to this group, uh, please let me know or please contact William Hines who runs uh, the NAEC group. Uh, to say that uh, you know, there is good global momentum for what we're talking about. Uh, the French government 
is taking over the European Union presidency next year, very soon in a few months. And they have noted that they will prioritize brain research for the EU presidency. So this, this is potentially upscaling neuroscience at a continental level in Europe. So it's awesome. So, so how does Australia keep up and make sure that we're benchmarking with this big work that's going on in Europe? Because we don't want to miss out. We don't want the European Union to overtake Australia. Um, this is a, a comment here from uh, Palal Swoboda, who is a European uh, diplomat. Uh, he's on our steering committee for the OECD, uh, talking about putting brain health at the center of the European policy agenda. This is, again, is, is part of what the French are going for and Pawal is trying to support them in this. How do we get neuroscience into policy thinking? What can Australia do in this regard? Uh, you know, can we influence Matthias Pullman to, to support the Europeans to do that? Matthias being the, the Secretary General of the OECD. Or what could Australia do you know, with APEC, with ASEAN, with the Pacific Island communities to do something global as well? Not just do this in Australia, but do something with our near neighbors. Uh, that's my challenge to APEC, and it's my challenge to ASEAN, and challenge to the Australian government. Uh, interestingly, when we think about uh, the, in the US context, where I live now, uh, there are many different councils within the executive office of the President of the United States within, within Joe Biden's office. Uh, in black, you see here all of the different councils. Uh, and then you see in blue how brain issues are associated with every single one of them. So the brain, again, is inextricably linked for the, the, the Council of Economic Advisors. You can see there, you know, they need to take into account the costs of lost productivity and direct and indirect costs of depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's disease, environmental quality. Are they taking into account brain issues uh, with, with air pollution and, and, and such? Uh, all the way through to science and technology policy. What are they doing for neurotechnologies? And what are they doing about the effects, the negative effects of social media on the brain? the effects of social media that's toxic on, 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 on teenage girls. What are they doing about that? So we, we're arguing now that uh, we need to have a brain capital council within the White House that can have an emissary to every other one of these established councils to really integrate this stuff and make sure that it's top of mind with all of these different council uh, chairs and, and groups. Uh, this is a very bold, perhaps heretical suggestion um, so let's see where it goes. It's very interesting and I think it's fairly defensible. So what could this look like in the Australian context? Uh, Texas 2036 is very much interested in neuroscience and how it relates to the future of Texas by 2036. So this is a policy economics innovation group. We're starting to engage with them around mental health and dementia issues. So wonderful to see them doing something at, at a Texas level. Of course, Texas is a, is a, is a, is a state of, of the US, but, but Texans sometimes consider themselves their own country. So, so we need to keep up with this country of Texas. In summary, again, just to, just to sort of weave it all together, all rows lead to the brain. We've talked about depression and anxiety and what that does to the brain. We've talked about economics, policy, early childhood, education. So what do you do in your day to day that is related to the brain? And what could you do better if you were more thoughtful about it to optimize your brain, your family's brain, your friend's brains, or you know, your business or your colleagues? That's, that's a challenge. Put yourself in, in, in the shoes here and think about what could you do to influence this? Ultimately, as we get back to this brain capital gap concept that, that Jay Weatherall has, uh, has developed, what can we do in blue to lessen the inequality? It means policy, it means economics, it means investing. It means all these different multi-pronged approaches because this is a whole of society, whole of government, cross-sectoral uh, activity here. We are having an OECD Brain Capital Day in Paris, January 28th. I welcome anyone that's interested to, to come and join us in person. Uh, reach out to me if you want to talk about it. It'll also be live streamed. And, and of course, wonderful that Matthias Coleman is, is, head, is heading the OECD now, so we can have a strong Australian contingent. Uh, maybe Julia Gillard might be able to speak at a public event as well. Uh, so I, I suggest we talked about France and Texas. Is Australia going to lead this work or are we going to follow behind Texas and France? I think we should lead it.
So where to from here, as I wrap up now, um, to say that uh, what are we going to do if you're an economist, if you're in a think tank or in a government, what can you do? If you're a policy thinker, policy strategist, academic, what can you do? If you're an investor, what could you do in this area to get creative? What could we do domestically? What could we do with APEC and ASEAN and other type of uh, uh, groups? And can Australia very simply lead in the early childhood brain development field? We have, we have Thrive by Five brain builders and thriving Queensland kids. Can we lead out some groups out of Texas, the Bezos Family Foundation of, uh, of, of Amazon fame or, and the Center uh, on the Developing Child? And of course, the Paul Ramsey Foundation is very interested in this and, and Hannah Barber uh, is leading their early childhood brain development program. So Australia has like four major entities that can lead this area globally. Um, and then a, a nice comment here from a colleague, Andrew Robb, the former trade investment minister, uh, to say that uh, he, he, he sort of sees this explanation and thinks that it's cogent as a way of grossing up what we artificially silo as these brain-based issues. Thank you to Andrew. Uh, so we all have a responsibility, uh, I think, to improve our societies. And, and this, this brain capital concept is a big canvas. So which part of the big canvas do you want to hold on to and make your own? Because this is, this is a team effort. This is a humble, egalitarian effort. Everyone needs to play a role in this. So which part of the canvas do you want to own? And I'll say thank you very much to everyone for your attention. I look forward to the discussion and any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harris, for those insights. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen online, for all the thoughtful questions and comments you've posted during the session. To assist Harris in addressing them all, it's my pleasure to now introduce our additional guest experts. Firstly, Laurie Rubenstein. Laurie is the director of the Brain Builders Alliance, an initiative of ARACI, the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth established to promote the use of neuroscience to improve outcomes for children and adolescents. Their goal is to help Australian children, regardless of who their parents are or where they grow up, to develop the functional capabilities to thrive. Also joining us is Matt Wright. Matt is one of the education sector leaders at Deloitte Australia. The focus of his team's research and advice is in the areas of school performance and improvement and spans all aspects of learner well-being, engagement and achievement. This policy and implementation work is increasingly interdisciplinary in keeping with the evolving thinking on how to improve education systems. Also on our team panel is Michael Hogan, who is an adjunct professor and Paul Ramsey Foundation Fellow here at QUT of whom we're very proud. He was formerly Director General of the Departments of Communities, Child Safety and Disability Services, and of Child Safety, Youth and Women in the Queensland Government. He is the convener of the Aracy Auspiced Thriving Queensland Kids Partnership, another of our collaborators in today's webinar. And to bring all of that together for our Q&A session, I also welcome my excellent colleague, Adam Lenahan, who's one of our partnership managers here at QTX and specialises in corporate and professional education across sectors. Over to you now, Adam. Wonderful, thank you very much, Melinda. And okay, just before I start, Harris, everyone's waxing lyrical about the presentation, thoroughly enjoyed, got a phenomenal visionary and a very important conversation. So looking forward to what's next. Um, so jumping to the questions, Harris, I might um, pose them to you and then you're welcome to um, invite the panelists to comment as well. So uh, Carly responded to Jay's opening about the predominantly female nurturing, noting that sharing of responsibilities is only part of the equation. Uh, what other initiatives would see greater equality across the gender relationships? I might hand that over to Laurie and Michael Hogan because I want to hear their opinions. Uh, they're really much deeper experts in that area than me. Um, Laurie, would you like to go first? Oh, you're on mute. Okay, I'm off mute, I think. Um, sure, just very quickly. Um, we do need to take account of the primary caregivers that really give our kids their start in life. Now, they're probably mostly women, but men, obviously, fathers and others play very important roles. We know 
that brain development is probably influenced more by early life experiences and relationships than anything else. So that even children, for example, who have to deal with a lot of adversity in their lives, if they have strong, responsive relationships, they can overcome adversity, they can deal with it, and they can thrive. So that's my sort of quick comment. Michael, over to you. Um, thanks, Laurie, and, and thanks, Kelly. It's a great question. And I, I guess that at a, at a national level, this is where the work that um, Jay Weatherall and Mindaroo and Thrive by Five and a whole coalition of organisations uh, involved in particularly trying to reframe a, a, a national agenda around early years, early child development, um, that brings in those threads of what's good for kids and what's good for uh, women and families and the broader economy. And um, you know, I really invite you to, to dive deeper into uh, the work that Aracy and the Front Project, uh, Parent the Parenthood, and Thrive by Five are, are contributing around a, a, a new national reform agenda using the sort of em, uh, emerging neuroscience and the frames that Harris has introduced us to, uh, to try and reset the case for, for big national reforms, starting but not only in the early years. Cool. Yeah, Thank you very much. Can I jump yeah. in, sorry, and, and just make, um, just on what Michael said there, not just the early years. One of the things we think is really important is that second window of opportunity in adolescence. And sometimes it gets kind of short shrift in our thinking and investing, but that's really critical as well. So um, that that um, uh, talks to a question that Bernadette raised as well, Laurie. So I might I'll jump in with that and then you can continue on that thread if you like. So Bernadette was looking at those life stages as windows of opportunities. So referencing obviously the first thousand days, um, and the huge amount of plasticity during that period. So, you know, what, what other areas can we look at? Um, noting that there are, you know, a myriad of opportunities for us to jump in throughout the life uh, cycle. Well, I think, I mean, certainly the brain is most plastic in those first, first years of life, but adolescence, a lot of brain restructuring and reforming is happening. And that's a really important time for us to think positively about adolescence and what we can do to build strong, resilient adolescents that then become, you know, our future adults, obviously. Um, so we need to be sure that we're not just paying attention to those first thousand days and assuming that if we don't, if we don't get it, then it's too late. That's simply not true. But let me just say also, but brain development doesn't stop with adolescence either. It continues throughout the life course. Now, working with a RACI, I'm probably more focused on children and adolescence than what happens as people age. But obviously, that's critical too. And let me just add one last thing, and that is that our way of thinking about this is that we need to build capabilities. And neuroscience has a lot to tell us about the kinds of capabilities we need to build in children and their parents and communities so they can facilitate healthy development and the systems themselves so that we create individuals that can buffer adversity, take advantage of opportunities and you know, enter adulthood as resilient, capable people. Really, I, I could maybe just, just sort of piggyback and extrapolate a little bit to say that uh, early childhood is obviously critical in, in adolescence, that's when the vast majority of mental disorders uh, develop, uh, more than 50% of them. So it's critical and Australia has been doing good things, you know, Headspace, uh, these types of entities. I'm aware that uh, Michael Burke is leading a large clinical trial network called Magnet out of Deakin, but it's all across every state of Australia, which is looking to develop and trial evidence-based solutions for adolescent mental health issues. Uh, then, you know, we've got to, we've got to think about what are we doing for, you know, perinatal mental health, perinatal blues, dep depression, things like this, and uh, perimenopausal issues, um, and, th and then also sort of dementia prevention. There are things that we can do, and Australia does wonderful things when it comes to dementia prevention. What can we do for uh, reducing risk of dementia, you know, better uh, heart, heart disease management, better um, you know, social connectivity, social activity, these physical activity, these types of things could potentially 
stave off uh, Alzheimer's disease for years if we do it well. So sort of what do we do about that from a public health perspective to make sure it actually happens? The, all this stuff is kind of critical if we look at it across the lifespan. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that's uh, popping up in the comments now as Laurie and um, Harris are talking. So K to 12 schooling, healthy brained adults positively influencing the development of healthy future adults. Um, and then another one that resonates particularly with me following my recent renewal of uh, my membership to the Sleep Deprivation Society is uh, becoming a parent and the huge impacts on the brain uh, for parents uh, during that period too. Uh, so uh, switching tack just quickly, um, BESG uh, is an interesting idea, uh, noting it's amongst Joe Biden's groups of interest. Uh, any examples of businesses in Australia looking at this? I is a very good question. I appreciate it. Um, I I am aware that uh, that there is some interest in developing a CRC for corporate mental health uh, in Australia. I think it's going to be based out of Monash. There's a consortium. Uh, if, if someone's interested, they can contact me and I can give them the details. Uh, so there is a consortium that's developing to look at this kind of. Um, to, to look at how do you support employee mental health. Uh, there was an interesting actually startup company out of Australia called Uprise that was, that was providing mental health support to employ, employer employees in Australia. And that was actually acquired by a, a large American company. So it was a sort of a successful Australian startup that was CEO uh, was Jay Spence. And then finally to say that the BESG movement is very, very, very early. Uh, what we're doing is we're publishing an open letter in the next couple of weeks to Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, uh, to ask him for an audience so we can sit and talk to him about this. And, you know, he's the biggest asset manager in the world. I think he manages four or five trillion. So, so we're trying to crack the, crack the ice here so that things can flow uh, after we sort of work with one of the biggest things will flow from there. Uh, so another comment says it almost seems impossible for shifts to occur in the uh, in the current uh, systems and structures that's so far from um, brain friendly environments. So what can be done immediately um, in the corporate sphere for in the absence of government policies? A really good point. I think. Uh... As, as Jay said, and as Michael and Laurie believe, we need a movement for change. This is not one person can do this. This is how do we create a movement? How do we create the organizations and the infrastructure to actually move things like across sectors and across different uh, disciplines? Uh, you know, it's been incredible with the, with the OECD work. Uh, we've, you know, the movement is a couple thousand people strong. So we're, we've started this movement and let's keep going on it. Let's see what we can do in Australia. QUT is obviously taking leadership. Uh, Jay Weatherall is interested in taking leadership. So, so let's make a movement. Um, and, and I would say, like, let's, let's make sure that we're benchmarking also with other parts of the world. That, that's maybe one thing that I can bring that's unique here is, like, as far as employee mental health things, there's a lot going on in the United States and a lot going on in the UK. So let's make sure that we're benchmarking. Let's, let's, if, if, if your company isn't keeping up, then show them the benchmark stuff and shame them into doing something with some benchmarking. And one of the comments was uh, Viva la Revolution. So, <laughs> Adam, can I, can I yes, just um, jump, jump in, in and sort of go from the global to the provincial? Um, just a, um, a little plug for the Thriving Queensland Kids Partnership. Um, because we're, this is a fledgling initiative. It is as a, emerging as a systems intermediary. And we see neuroscience as one of the catalysts for systems change, for paradigm shifts. And I know there have been a couple of comments in the, in the chat about, about communications and and uh, uh, and the framing of this that sort of Jay introduced. So we're, um, we're advancing working with Laurie um, on developing a Queensland Brain Builders program that can, can operationalize, can translate and deploy the emerging neuroscience into sort of suite of fields. And we're really keen to engage with corporate Queensland or, 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 or other corporates um, along with the philanthropy sector and the tertiary sector uh, governments and not-for-profits in getting engaged in these really practical ways, particularly with public purpose organisations and social impact investing in, in using this neuroscience, uh, particularly 
to deal with the in inequity and adversity uh, that, that um, Jay and, and Harris um, spoke to. So um, you know, we'd love to have, hear from anyone who's interested to get engaged with us, either at a national level with Laurie, I'm sure, or in Queensland here through the Tribe in Queensland Kids Partnership. Can I just jump in and just make a quick comment? <clears throat> um, I think in with brain builders or building brains in Australia, we've taken um, some lessons to heart from the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative in Canada that has been so excess, successful in mobilizing neuroscience to build alignment across sectors. And that's speaks to this issue of yes lots of things are happening but they're often happening in silos and we're not we're not sort of getting things to be transdisciplinary or to be aligned and i think we have an opportunity to use neuroscience to really help us jumpstart that kind of alignment laurie can i just add one more one more thing i i think um it's been referred to a, a few times today but in the in the course of uh getting a movement going, um, similar to what a race is already doing, it, it often comes back to measurement. And, um, you know, uh, it's very, it seems, in my experience, it's, it's quite difficult to, um, to see public parties fund the measurement systems that we need when that, that money is otherwise um, diverted to frontline staff in educational health or whatever it might be. Uh, so perhaps that's a call out to the philanthropic parties as well, if there's an, interest in diverting some of the programmatic funding towards uh, measurement systems that may be a real head start and uh, you know government and public funding can come in behind that um, with the success demonstrated exactly as a race is is doing and what and while we uh, what, oh, sorry I just say, say, say a comment. Let, let me just say a comment uh, i totally agree with matt this is such a new area it kind of needs philanthropy. Uh, that's how we've been able to build it up so far through generosity of, of people, uh, families and foundations. And because we don't have 10 years of data to prove this uh, and, and all the academic papers and this, that and the other, and all the data analytics, because it's such a it's such a late breaking field with so many things going on. We, we just don't have that. And we can't wait 10 years. So we can't wait for the typical conventional sort of government approach to funding this. It has to be philanthropy. And and, it, and the US does philanthropy well. And I know that Australia has a, a number of very interesting foundations that can do things. So I absolutely endorse that, that philanthropy needs to help, absolutely. And, and we are working on the index and the tracking. It's not easy. Uh, you know, there are different groups out there at World Health Organization, World Bank that we partner with to try to piggyback off of them and sort of upgrade some of their index and, and tracking. But, you know, it's taking time of really, a con we have a working group focused on this Two economists lead it with neuroscience and psychology and different types of other uh, neuro experts involved to try to work out what would an index for a dashboard of indices look like. Thank you, Harrison. Look, uh, while Matt had the spotlight, we've got another question coming through. They uh, probably feel from Jacqueline. So she's coming from a state government research and policy perspective is asking, uh, can you offer any suggestions for translating what is essentially a, a health-based concept into non-health settings, for example, employment and workforce skills, education and training, uh, citing it's often challenging to make scope stretch far enough to bring in longbow concepts. Yeah, well, I think um, Harris's comments just then, among among others, uh, have given us a clear way forward. I mean, it, um, as as an economist, economists and policy advisors have. Um, they're holding the microphone a lot of the time in um, uh, a lot of the advice that's being given to decision makers around um, how to improve policy or where to take policy next. I think it's incumbent upon us to, um, as Harris is inviting us to do, uh, become more transdisciplinary, be more curious about uh, other frameworks and other ways of thinking beyond our economics training, invite others into the projects that we're responsible for delivering or you know, to the bodies that we govern. And um, I think through that combination of, of different perspectives and different disciplines, we can stretch the traditional, um, the traditional bounds uh, that something is just a health issue or just an education issue or just a skills issue. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think it's a bit incumbent upon people in those you know, privileged positions to, to drive this because uh, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't seem like it'll happen 
uh, organically or not, not quick enough at least. And, and, and maybe just to put a, a, a point on that as well, Matt, to piggyback, uh, the, the OECD NAEC group, New Approaches to Economic Challenges, that, that unit that, that, that we're part of, we're housed within. Uh, William Hines is an economist that runs that. He's an Irish economist uh, living in Paris, and he has pioneered the field of integrated economics, which is really how do you, with starting with economics, pulling in all these different disciplines. And so, uh, you know, he's an economist, I'm not, so I don't ask me complex economics things, but, you know, we should get him on a road show in Australia because he, he's the guy that, 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 you know, has pioneered this field. So if he's the kind of guy that can soften up economists to think about this and be more open-minded, if that's, if that's possible, open-minded economists, not a, uh, I'm sure it's not oxymoron. We're working on it. We're working on it. I think so can I just make a, a quick comment about, about that, that, because we have such a diversity of stakeholder groups who are trying to engage in thinking about this, I'm wondering about the kinds of strategic framing we might need to consider. I mean, um, I'm certainly aware that the way I have often talked about disadvantage is probably not the best way to talk about it to, to cut through with a broad range of stakeholder groups. <clears throat> and here, I mean, we've got everything from corporate sector and economists to early childhood educators, parents who are raising the next generation. We've got incredibly diverse audiences. And so I wonder if we need to spend some time thinking about how we strategically frame our discussion so it'll cut through. Thank you very much all. Look, there's another question now around uh, from James and that's around social media and it's great to see the effects of social media being highlighted. Um, I will point so that he asked about um, the outrage algorithm reshaping brain capital and I might uh, make a plug for the last Real World Futures event that we did with Professor Axel Bruns um, who delivered a great presentation around the, the impacts of social media more broadly on society but uh, any any comments to that Harris? Uh, I, you know, I think it just, you know, I, I propose this to Matt, perhaps, and, and, and then to James as well. I, I think that it, you know, it, it comes to the economics, right? It's called attentional economics. Uh, social media companies make money off of attention. Uh, and they know, because they have a lot of neuroscientists and psychologists, that you get more attention, more eyeballs, looking at more ads and make more money out of ads uh, when people are outraged. And so they're just, they're just like following capitalist imperatives to make money through outrage. And, and, it's, and it's unrestrained and it's rampant, right? And they claim to be doing things about it. Is it working? Look at the Facebook revelation. You know, Francis Hogan's been on a, on a road show of the US and of the UK recently. I'm not sure where she is now in the world. We need to take this stuff seriously because, and she's suggesting fixes. There are obviously different instruments we can use to try to fix this from, from a big stick and sort of antitrust action and serious regulation to little sticks and everything in between. And I'm not an expert on how to regulate these things, but I think we need to look at it because it's really toxic. I mean, Mark Benioff, uh, the, 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 the founder of Salesforce used to call social media cigarettes for the brain. And now he started calling it crack for the brain. Uh, so this, I think it's serious. And, I, you know, attentional economics, it all comes back to e economics to me. Um, so I don't know if Matt has any comments to make as the economist here. Yeah, thanks, Harris. Why? Well, I, I mean, I think regulation is a tempting solution at, at face value, but it's um, very difficult to get it to work the way we want it to in reality. Um, and so then there are perhaps some some combination of that and you know other responses i mean the the skills that are being um deployed in those particular platforms those um data science skills and other sort of creative skills i mean we need to try and attract those particular individuals across to the other side of the ledger i suspect and um you know what is it about the roles that we all play that we can uh you know, pitch to those individuals as a, as a meaning, you know, um, I don't want to say it, but like a meaningful alternative to um, some of what they're presently doing. Um, maybe, maybe to um, pay, pay some back for some of the 
harm that it's causing. Uh, so I think, you know, many of us have a um, have a slightly sort of altruistic responsibility to to better market the roles that we all have and attract those skills into our professions where they're just, they're just not um, in abundance at this stage. Thank you. So look, um, Kayla's passed a uh, comment, uh, there needs to be substantially increased focus on both education individuals and organisations about maintaining brain health uh, and, on, and help them remain motivated to engage in advantageous health and lifestyle behaviours. So on this point about the workforce, what are your thoughts, Michael? Um, yeah, look, thank you. It's a, it's a great observation and um, absolutely true. Um, as you might have gathered, our particular focus with Thriving Queensland Kids partnership is on all the systems and sectors that are child, youth and family facing. But even just in Queensland, in this state, that's tens of thousands of workers across child maternal health, public health, mental health, disability housing, education, early childhood, child protection, family support, and so on. So there are tens of thousands of workers in those in those sectors who are directly fat child youth and family facing. Uh, and um, you know, one of our we, we've had a fantastic engagement from government agencies, our statutory bodies, uh, not for profits, uh, and the tertiary sector about our our focus on stronger workforce. So what what's the capability uplift we can get with using neuroscience as one of the common lang sets of language and skills and behaviors across all of those workforces that's good for those workers and good for their for their clients um for the children young people and families that they work with and uh you know we, we we've been struck by the fact that we don't have a common coherent sort of human capability framework um a sort of point laurie raised before in any jurisdiction in australia that cuts across all of those systems and sectors, and that speaks to all of those workforces. And so we think um, neuroscience um, is one of the critical catalysts for workforce well-being and health, and for addressing the sort of impacts of adversity and inequity, um, and helping all kids and young people and their families thrive. Any further comments from the panel on that one? There, am I unmuted? There we go. Yeah, just, sorry. Um, just a, a, a quick additional comment is that one of the things that I've been hearing a lot about over the last couple of years is that, yes, there are lots of resources out there that might be relevant to different groups, different professions, whatever. People are having difficulty navigating them, though. And I, I mean, Harris, you mentioned so many things going on internationally and and nationally and all over the place and sometimes i think that vast array sort of paralyzes us we don't know where to go we don't know where to start how do we navigate through this can you do you have some words of wisdom for that uh, i i uh I don't know if I have any words of wisdom. I, th I think we need to we need to keep talking about these things, right? And we need to try to find words of wisdom. I was struck by an anecdote the other day that the finance minister of Canada was in Ottawa and spoke to someone at the supermarket and said, "What do you make of how's your life going? How's you know what do you think about life right now?" And the person said, "The, the you know a, 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 just a, a person said, I, I don't understand the world. I don't understand uh, what's going on." at all and the finance minister said well i don't understand either i don't understand how the economy works or society or policy or what's going on globally or domestically in canada so you know everyone's confused so i don't i don't have a, a magic wand um but I, I i really do think that this kind of discussion we're having is meritorious and we need to keep at it and we need to you know we need philanthropy to help uh and we need to keep convening diverse people to, to start to think about this stuff um and and you know we, we want to work on simple things like policy primers uh we're going to work on policy primers for this type of stuff so that we can you know let's try to make this maybe to say like let's make this top of top five issue for every politician 
uh, that, that, that way we might be able to get some change, but it's going to take time because these are big complex systems that we're trying to influence. And that's a good point there, Harry, and I might um, hand the baton over to Matt if, he, if he's willing to provide some observations about what government's doing in Australia now in that regard. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Well, I think, um, uh, but just, I think just over the last couple of years, starting to see um, state governments, uh, particularly on the eastern side of the country, make some interesting inroads there, either on the, um, the technology front, so interesting endeavours to start to um, have unique identifiers from birth onwards of, um, yeah, members of the community so that we can track um, how they're going, what sort of support they're getting across different uh, services and where their needs are. And it's still very early days for these child link type programs and unique uh, child identifiers and things, but they're, they're slowly taking shape. Also just very recently, only a week or so ago, I've seen the first um, invitation for an organization like ours to join thinking around you know, first thousand days, first 2000 days sort of initiatives and to partner with government to help them uh, design and, and implement those things are very difficult exercises of, of design and implementation and no one should be going these alone. So it's wonderful to see government start to take those steps. But again, if these things aren't um, given the same prominence in the public discussion as some other issues in, in health and education, they, they won't be the priorities, they won't get it, uh, the funding that they need. So we just need to continue to find ways to make, uh, make them more accessible. And, um, you know, different parties that are good at translating this, like Harris and, and Laurie and Michael and, and QUT more broadly, um, just continuing to do what they, what they do in making this accessible as we're doing today. I mean, one of the things that I think, Michael, you chime in here, please, but that Brain Builders and Thriving Queensland Kids have decided that one major target would be the professional workforces, not just workforce, that engage directly with children, adolescents and families, and to try to use neuroscience insights and concepts to upskill that workforce. So that at that level, I mean, that's one point of leverage. That's very sort of direct service, science to service kind of leverage. Um, while we're working on the broader policy agenda and system transformation agenda. So, I mean, I think that was quite a clear decision that, that we all made. Yeah, we, um, it, it, we got a really strong message from um, the systems leaders that we engaged uh, that we needed to go for the, the big levers for systems change. So leadership, workforce, investment, uh, engagement, uh, and uh, integrated delivery. And you know, we, so we see neuroscience along with perhaps place as those sort of paradigm shifting um, uh, catalysts that we can get very practical um, and uh, I, I'd be really interested to others in, engaged in the call and to pick up some of the themes about impact investment and investment that um, have popped up in the chat that Harris has already spoken to. Um, I, I see, I see capitalism really embracing and 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 starting to mobilise and use the, this emerging neuroscience. I, I guess I'm particularly keen and concerned that that's we also start to see that in the public purpose sector. Um, for social impact investment and for in public programs. So on that point, uh, Michael, we've got a question from Fleur that she's posing to the panel. So she said, the thing that makes innovation thrive is capital. Uh, the thing that private investors look for is rapid growth in sales, for example. Uh, if we want businesses with innovative solutions to grow, they need customers. So how does the panel think we can better stimulate investment in innovative startup and scale-ups who have solutions for some pieces of this puzzle? Um, look, uh, 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 and a little anecdote that comes to mind, um, I don't, if anyone, um, perhaps in Australia at least, has seen the program, the Gruen Transfer, that um, uh, does a, a wonderful critique uh, of, uh, of advertising. I mean, observation was made a couple of months ago um, by one of the panelists who's, who's um, you know, right into the brain science 
about one of the most successful startup well-being apps through COVID last year globally was an Adelaide-based uh, enterprise that had picked up the brain health, brain science, and embedded that into the offer through that through that app. Right, and you know, so you know, you, he commented on this sort of shift from a focus on exercise to nutrition to brains that's emerging in that well-being sort of industry. Mm. So I think we're seeing signs of it already. Um, I, know, I know Fleur who asked that question is doing some amazing work around uh, teacher and student um, well-being. And um, uh, you know, I see examples like Fleur's and, uh, and others emerging uh, that, um, that I think are gonna uh, really quickly pick up and, 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 and grow. But we do need to see a sort of a public in, in policy dialogue about the appropriate settings, about the appropriate regulation, um, as Matt alluded to, um, that uh, then can ensure that we're actually getting quality product uh, and that these things do good, not harm, because they're. Yeah. I mean, a, a couple of other brief thoughts. Uh, we have a future fund, a sovereign wealth fund to that could help venture capital funds to be a little bigger. I know that I think it's the MCRF or the, you know, that there are some examples of the, of the, of the um, MRFF, which is putting some capital into, into VCs in, 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 in particularly in the Eastern Seaboard of Australia to try to support these VCs to, to do more investing, to help Australian companies grow quicker. Uh, because the capital markets, say in California, Boston, New York, are much, much bigger. So we need to try to recognize that and try to keep the capital market, build the capital markets a little bit more. Of course, we can't make them too big because then we don't necessarily have the executive expertise to grow these companies. So we sort of also need to work on our workforce stuff. And then I think that uh, effective conduits for Australian companies to go overseas to, to generate revenue are important. I think of uh, Austrade, who established a, um, a bio bridge uh, for healthcare companies with the Texas Medical Center in Houston. I, I went across that, that bio bridge with a company uh, and, and it was wonderful to have Austrade support um, that the staff there to, to help us to grow the company in the US through the Texas Medical Center. So, so these types of approaches, I think we, we need to keep in mind, but let's make sure we don't just do it for uh, clinical things like mental health issues and Alzheimer's disease, let's do it for education. Uh, let's do it for early childhood brain development, things that aren't like clinical disorders, but, but still neuroscience inspired innovations. So maybe it needs to come out of just being, you know, sovereign wealth money going through Greg Hunt, the health minister's office to the education minister and other types of ministries to make it a little bit more cross ministerial. All right, thank you very much. Well, look, and moving on to the last question. So apologies to those that are just under firing questions now. Uh, but if you did want to email us at qtx at qt.edu.au, uh, we'll forward on to the panel and the panel will respond to you shortly after this presentation. Uh, so last question for you all uh, from uh, Baskiri. Resilience is a high profile topic in many industry sectors, where tools for being resilient uh, is espoused for dealing with mental health stresses. Where does brain health and uh, the neuroscience of mental health fit with these concepts of resilience? I think it's front and center um, that what we're really trying to do is to help create more resilient individuals, but also more resilient communities to facilitate healthy development and more, more um, uh, and in terms of systems as well. So I think it kind of runs through all different levels of, of the sector. Yeah. And I also think, just want to add one little thing, that so much of our attention is about is using a deficit perspective. I mean, mental illness, yes, we do need to deal with, with mental illness and trying to prevent it and to mitigate it, et cetera. And later life, Alzheimer's and things that happen. But I think we need to change that perspective to one where we're going to strengthen brain health um, and build resilience, which is part of, of doing that, of strengthening brain health, because then that allows individuals and families and communities to prosper no matter what. 
It allows them to deal with adversity if it hits. It allows them to take advantage of opportunities when they emerge. So I think it's right front and center. Thank you so much to all of you. And I sense that this conversation could have gone on for some time further. And I endorse what Adam has said to you, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to reach out to our panel, they are very keen to connect with you and to hear more about how we can work together to make a difference in this space. But it's my job um, to sum up and what an intellectual feast we've enjoyed this morning. Let's revisit some of the morsels um, that we've been served. Firstly, social media is toxic to our brains. Who knew? GDP measures everything except that which is worthwhile. And we are told the very reassuring words that if we can sort out brain capital, everything else will take care of itself. But it is going to take much more than generosity to make that happen. So what does that mean for our future? Will a brain capital focus for the future require a new human-centered narrative of progress? Probably. Could it mean the end of mental health stigma, inequality and plastic? Hopefully. And will it require more informed and intentional ethical decision making across all layers of government and business into our future? Definitely. Here at QUT, impactful research and education for the real world is in our DNA. So if you'd like to explore any of those opportunities further, please feel free to contact us after this broadcast. When will we see you again? Our next Real World Futures event is scheduled for early 2022, and you'll hear more from us about that exciting journey soon. Until then, please keep your feedback coming, especially when we follow you up after this event, and, and keep us informed about topics you'd like to see us visit in our future discussions. Until we see you again, ladies and gentlemen, please stay safe and well wherever you may be. Thank you and good morning.